What the is up, world? Bialy Plaltik Pak. We back in this. Another podcast for that. Another grito. Se ha dicho. Coming about. I don't know, dog. <laughs> I guess like a month, maybe. Something like that. I really don't care. Uh, and the reason being is, um, you know, after my last episode, I realized it coincided with the, you know, with, with the end of the year. So I was like, okay, dog, let's just shut this down for the rest of the winter break. And we'll pick back up after the rising of the Huitzilopochtli, right? The winter sun. And um, yeah, you know, that's about, was that happened about a week and a half ago. We're now in the quote unquote new year, the Gregorian new year, the year 2024, according to European Christian folks, right? And uh, I said, okay, dog, let's pick up back with this podcast and let's keep it rocking, right? And uh, part of that, before we get into the episode, is uh, actually influenced by the Huitzilopochtli, right? Um, the four potentials, dog, the four sons. Uh, the the, the Huitzilopochtli, right? The Huitzilin, the hummingbird in Nahua, right? And then Pochtli means the left side, right? So the, the left-sided hummingbird. Uh, why is it the hummingbird? Because the hummingbird flies lowest to the ground, which is during the quote unquote winter solstice is exactly where the sun is. It's its lowest point to the ground, which is why we have the, the shortest day and the longest night. Right. So our ancestors, when you know they were doing their whole cosmology, they recognized this and they said, this is the winter sun. This is the Huitzilin sun, the Huitzilopochtli, the one that flies on the left side. Why the left side? Because if say you're walking from if you're a sun, OK, and you're rising, let's say you're facing down towards Tlaltic Pak, which is what the calendar is, you know, that whole quote unquote Aztec stone calendar. That's what it is. It's Tlaltic Pak. That's what they felt that the, it's not what they felt. It's metaphorical, just so we're clear, right? But that was their representation of Earth here, Tlaltic Pak. But uh, so yeah, dog, the sun is rising from the east and, you know, working its way towards the west, which, you know, would imply then that it, during this winter solstice, as the sun is setting, right, we're facing it this way that the sun is setting in, in this particular direction, which is the left-handed side, right? So uh, this is why they call it the left-handed uh, the left-handed hummingbird, the Huitzilopochtli, right? It's got nothing to do with the god of war. We didn't believe in gods. It's got nothing to do with that. It's the sun, you know what I mean? And uh, there's so much more knowledge about this that merits its own discussion. And there are people that provide it, hence, you know, the sources that I get it from. You know what I mean? Meaning that this is not necessarily the space for this particular discussion. I only bring it up because of the a little bit of the wisdom that I wanted to share with it. And that is what the Huitzilopochtli is, right? What the Huitzilin is, our hummingbird, okay? And uh, the reason why is because despite, uh, on top of the fact that it's just a way of, you know, I guess celebrating the new year in a more Nawa way, even though a Nawa new year hasn't really passed, uh, it's introducing a little bit of, it, like, it gave me a lot of insight, dog, to me personally, right? And um, I hope that it does the same for you, which is why I want to share it. And uh, some of the insight that it gave me was, you know, I've spoken openly about my admiration of Nietzsche on this, you know what I mean? The whole episodes on the boy. And I've talked about how in the past he's been so deeply influential in my life. And I never, I don't want to say I never understood why. I know why, right? But there was unquestionably a little bit of tension within me because it, I just, I hated the idea that I was giving European thinkers alone credit. You know what I mean? Because I just, it just really bothers me. It just rubs me the wrong way. And uh, I felt that way for the longest time until I read our ancestral philosophy. And it bothers me because it just upholds this myth of European superiority, just so we're clear. Like the idea that nobody but Nietzsche and European German thinkers by proxy, even though Nietzsche was like, vehemently anti-nationalist right he considered himself a citizen of the world but um for me personally the idea that european german thinkers like nietzsche were responsible for these grand insights into reality is part of what upholds this myth of european superiority white superiority because they use it to justify this false belief that only european people can do philosophy you know what i mean so that's why it bothered me for so long and then i started reading our ancestral philosophy and i realized oh dog Come on, man. Our ancestors knew this long before Nietzsche was ever even a thought of, before he was a little dirty thought in his mama's eye. You know what I mean? And uh, that's, you know, that's why I always say that, like Nietzsche was a Nawa. He was breaking through to the Nawa side. You know what I mean? Um, because a lot of the insights that he made, they were, you know, definitely heavily Nawa influenced. 
But uh, the reason why I bring this up, I know I've mentioned that in the past, but the reason why I bring it up is because me personally, one second, whenever I would teach Nietzsche in my own classes, I would kind of bastardize it in a way that wasn't necessarily explicitly Nietzsche, but that I felt was, you know, Nietzsche never really like wrote it down explicitly the way that I would teach it. But when I, you know, was learning Nietzsche, this the way it made sense to me. It made perfect sense to me. And I was speaking, when I would speak specifically on the will to power, and, uh, you know, the will to power is a whole concept in its, that merits its own podcast. You know what I mean? But uh, the basic idea was the strength of the will. And uh, one thing that I would talk about in my classes is that we're not talking about power in its physical sense, something I've mentioned on this podcast before. Um, but the reason being, just to reiterate, is because, you know, that kind of power, as it were, is very... Um, it's very reductive of what power is. And it was actually used to justify a lot of this false beliefs that Nietzsche himself was a Nazi because, you know, obviously his sister took his philosophy and bastardized it and uh, used it to justify the power that the, you know, Nazis had taken it for. And that is physical strength, which I mean, it is it is that it is that for our ancestors, for sure. Right. But it's so much more than that. And, you know, before I knew what the Huichil, what the Huichilins were, the four Huichilins of our ancestors, which was literally like. <laughs> a month ago, less than a month ago, you know what I mean? Uh, I would just teach you when I was teaching Nietzsche, I would say he's not speaking just of physical power. He's speaking of emotional power. He's speaking of attitudinal power. He's speaking of, more importantly, a spiritual power. You know what I'm saying? And uh, yeah, dog, I would do that. It was like five years worth of Nietzsche teaching that I would teach that kind of shit. And it wasn't until literally a couple of weeks ago, less than a month ago for sure, that I realized that's exactly what the four Huitzilines are. That's what our four hummingbirds are. This is what our ancestors were telling us. It's all metaphor, dog. The cosmos is just a grand manifestation of the most infinitely minute you know, facets of reality. It's all one. That's why a sun, or rather planets circulating a sun, look exactly like an atom, or rather the, the proton circling an, uh, an atom. You know what I mean? Like it's just it, everything is everything. And uh, what the four Huitzilipochtli, or the four rather Huitzilines are for our ancestors was, again, a mental, a mental power, like attitudinal, right? Uh, fortitude. Um, but it was also emotional strength, dog. And more importantly, it was the spiritual strength, yes. But then the fourth one was the physical strength, dog. And having all four of them come together is our Huitzilipochtli. That's the quote-unquote God that gets associated with an Aztec quote-unquote God of war. You know what I mean? And it's like, nah, dog. The Nawa didn't worship gods. It was, a, it was a cluster of divinities that was attributed to these actions that we personally possess. Ourselves, we are the Huitzilopochtli. We have the strength of the universe within us, quite literally. And they are represented to us by these hummingbirds, the four hummingbirds that is represented during the winter solstice. Why the winter solstice? Because again, it is the longest night and the shortest day. Why is that important? Because look at a hummingbird, man. Look at how tiny a hummingbird is. But even the strength of the hummingbird is powerful enough to drive away the darkest night, right? And that's the idea here is that you have within you, we all have within us these little hummingbirds. This hummingbird is left-handed hummingbird, right? And we have the power to manifest that strength within us to overcome even the greatest obstacles in life, no matter how difficult they may appear to be. So, yeah, dog, that's kind of where I've been in the last couple of weeks, months, however however long it's been since I've dropped an episode, right? So I just wanted to share a little bit of that ancestral wisdom before I continue along with this. And uh, I guess I should emphasize that this actually has nothing to do with Nawa philosophy today. Not explicitly, per se. You know what I mean? It's actually just a quick little... It, it, it's two parts, dog. The first part... I mean, the second part, I guess I'll start with by way of introduction is I'm going to do the belly. I'm going to do the belly. I ain't forget about that. You know what I mean? But... uh the first part is actually like just a quick little run in the back of the some of the events and ideas, I guess, that I've had in the time that it's been since the last time I dropped an episode. And just a few of them, right? But the ones that I really felt are are very, very important right now, dog, just because not only of the effect that they're going to have on the world as a whole that I think they should have, but also because in a way, dog, I kind of feel like a little bit of vindication. And I hate to use that word, but... I, I guess it's it's the correct word to use, dog. And the reason why is because I'm not going to front, bro. You know, this this podcast, I have a 
you know, sometimes I, I sometimes I trip. I'm like, damn dog, like I got a I got a family, bro. <laughs> you know what I mean? I got shit that I got to be mindful of. I can't, you know. It's not that I can't, because I can. I can say whatever the fuck I want, but there are re- repercussions. You know what I mean? And uh, especially, I'm not even speaking about just like interpersonal, because. I don't fuck with normies, dog. I don't fuck with NPCs. They're not in my circle. You know what I mean? None of my family are fucking cringed NPC normies, bro. So it's not even like that. You know what I mean? I'm speaking more specifically in terms of my career, I guess, if I'm being completely explicitly honest with you. And uh, the reason being is because, dog, at the end of the day, I'm a philosophy professor. You know what I mean? And I have to be mindful of the fact that I do represent not just collegiate institutions, but also that you know, I have to be mindful of the fact that people learn philosophy from me, meaning that I can't just put myself out in a way where I appear to be fucking. I mean, I can, dog. There's, you know, philosophy professors out there that, you know, they're fucking in shambles, bro. But for me personally, I just I feel I have such a responsibility where I can't put myself out in such a way where I look unqualified to be teaching philosophy and by proxy unqualified to be learning some, for someone to be learning philosophy from me. You know what I mean? Um, so with sometimes when I'm fucking with some of these ideas, it's like, bro, all right, man, like there's this, there's this balance. Okay. And the balance is you have to speak your truth to power on the one hand, but on the other hand, you have to be mindful of the fact that people do perceive shit and may not understand shit the way that you're trying to convey it. You know what I mean? People believe other things than you believe. And you have to be aware of that. And some of those people have authority, you know, in the institutions that you work at. And they can, you know, use that authority to not just silence you because they don't even, it wouldn't even be a matter of silencing. It'd be a matter of just no longer employing me. You know what I mean? So it's been like a really, it, it's a very, it's a very fine line, dog. And that's why sometimes I try to go explicitly out of my way to state that I'm really not a conspiracy theorist. I, I think the ideas are fun. I think they're novel. But at the end of the day, dog, I am a philosopher. I, I maintain that for a reason. Okay? Uh, at best, I will entertain these ideas, A, for me personally, because they're just a hobby of mine. I've always, I've always, you know, growing up in the hood, I've mentioned it before. That's what we do. We sit around, we smoke weed, we listen to hip-hop music, and, you know, we're listening to Mob Deep and Prodigy talk to us about the Illuminati. And, of course... Fucking 12-year-old does is going to go around and be like, yeah, dog, the Illuminati running the world. You know what I mean? That's just the culture of the hood. That's that's how I grew up. Part of it. You know what I mean? And uh, But the second part is because I do see them as, you know, novel thought experiments. But perhaps more importantly, dog, more explicitly to the point is I do see in a lot of people who are conspiratorially inclined a general inquisitive and rationality and reason that was not satisfied by public schools. And for me personally... A lot of the impetus to start this project was to show people like, hey, dog, these motherfuckers, A, aren't wrong. And B, these motherfuckers, like y'all need to be more direct and reasonable with your thinking skills so that you're not perceived as a fucking joke. Because some of what you're saying is actually very important in terms of, you know, critical theory and needs to be taken seriously. That's why I don't fucking that's why I don't fuck with the flat earth. I don't give a fuck about the flat earth. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's so outlandish and fucking I just it just does not doesn't even register in terms of importance in my life, okay? Not because I don't think the earth could potentially be fall or round or rather flat, rather. I don't fucking know. I've never, you know, I don't know any of that shit and I don't care either. That's the point. But more importantly, it, it, is, it isn't registered to me because there's so much more important shit going on that, you know, needs to be the actual center of focus. And when you start talking about shit like flat earth, like people just, you know, check out. They're like, why the fuck would I listen to what this person has to say? He's a flat earther. You know what I mean? She's a flat earther. And it's just, you're doing yourself a disservice. And then also the other part of the critique is something more I'm going to talk about here in a little bit is like, these conspiracy fools are so confused about who they think is, you know, allegedly running shit when it's like, there's a very clear answer and it's fucking accepted in academia. Like you're, you know, that's why, that's why I emphasize the whole Marxist perspective too, because like, dude, like (laughs) you're over here fucking blaming interdimensional space lizards, but the real issue is the bourgeoisie. You know what I mean? Maybe there's interdimensional space lizards in the bourgeoisie, but when you talk about these fucking reptilian overlords, you know, the general population is going to completely tune out, right? And by doing so, it kind of fucking, understandably, by the way, but by doing so, what happens is you actually end up jeopardizing the actual important message, and that is that there is a fucking small group of people with an inordinate amount of power who are running shit, dog. You don't need to call them interdimensional space lizards because they have a name. Again, they're the bourgeoisie. You know what I'm saying? So 
a little bit of the impetus as to why I wanted to, you know, when I first started this podcast of like, it was why I'm, I'm going to entertain the conspiracy theorists because it's like, you're not a conspiracy theorist, homie. You're a confused worker. And I can try to help, you know, <laughs> clarify some of that confusion so that we can, you know, start unifying essentially under what really needs to be, you know, the real issue here. And that is that it's a, the, the, everyone, everyone, dog, the whole world, the proletariat against a small group of people who are making life miserable for the rest of us. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, dog. And uh, all that to say is that one of the conspiracies then that I was very, you know, I, I would be mindful of when I was posting it because it's like, damn, dog, again, you know, this is, for some people, it's a very hard, heavy pill to swallow, especially at the very beginning. You know what I mean? When it was first introduced. And I'm talking about before Epstein fucking hung himself, supposedly, right? By the way, I know most of you listening to this know this, but just for the importance of the episode today, the reason why I say allegedly, the reason why we say Epstein didn't kill himself is twofold. The first of which is the easy one that everyone knows, and that is, of course, that he did not fucking hang himself, okay? No one believes that. Even the most skeptic of motherfuckers don't believe that he hung himself, right? And the second reason is because some of, some people don't believe he ever died in the first place, dog. You can't trust what they tell us on the news. You can't trust what they tell us in the media. I've, you know, like, it just I, I wasn't there, so I don't believe it, basically. You know what I'm saying? And uh, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I don't know. I don't care. Either way, right? What I do care about is that just talking about the fact that there was, you know, this elite group of people who were trafficking children and using them for fucking to blackmail the presidents of the United States was at one point considered a far, wing, far right wing unhinged, you know, conspiracy theory, dog. And that's why, you know, you got to be mindful because it's like, well, people are coming to you to learn philosophy. And if you associate yourself with this kind of shit and more importantly, if other people believe that because... You know, they don't delve into the world of conspiracies and they only believe what the fucking news is telling them. Then they're going to look at you and say, well, this motherfucker is not qualified to be teaching philosophy. Right. But again, that this is only a conspiracy for motherfuckers who are just ignorant NPC normies, bro, because in the hood, we'll tell you straight up. Yeah, dog, they've been stealing fucking motherfuckers here since Europeans got here. Literally, the history of Turtle Island, the history of the United States of America is a history of human trafficking. They stole indigenous peoples from here and they sent them back to Europe to be uh, to Europe to be slaves. They stole fucking uh you know black people from Africa and they brought them here to be slaves. That's human trafficking, dog. That is the history of the United States of America, okay? Um and uh so when we tell you that it's you know it shouldn't be a con- it shouldn't be considered a conspiracy. And in fact, believing it as such it's actually vehemently anti-indigenous, dog, because we are telling you, like, yeah, dog, they've been stealing our ancestors and sending them across the way. They, you know, they're 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 currently taking, exploiting our ancestral migration routes and stealing people along the way as they work their way from the south of the Condor to the north of the fucking uh, of the Eagle. You know what I mean? Like, from quote unquote South America to quote unquote North America. But um, when we tell you this, it shouldn't be considered a conspiracy. It should be something that motherfuckers take seriously because it is seriously. But again, you know, unless the news tells most of these NPC normies otherwise, they'll fucking just see it as a conspiracy, which is unfortunate because it's a lot of real damage that happens in, in the wake of doing so. You know what I mean? So uh, that's the reason why, despite, you know, all the alleged, not, it's not alleged, it's real fear associated with talking about Epstein long before the human trafficking, long before Epstein hung himself, supposedly, long before, you know, the names were revealed on, on, on news networks. Me personally, I still felt like this is something that needs to be talked about, dog, um, because of how important it is in our community at large, but just humanity as a whole, for sure. You know what I mean? So all that to say then, yeah, dog, justification, vindication, like, whew, motherfuckers, we told you. Now the news is telling you, bro. The news is telling these NPC normies. Yeah, dog, these motherfuckers were stealing kids, bro. And they were taking them to a fucking secret island where politicians from around the world and the elite from around the world were going to fucking abuse these children, dog. It's not a conspiracy. This is a fucking proven fact. You know what I mean? So <laughs> it's a little bit of what I'm going to talk about right now. But I, before I get into it, it's just the vindication. Like, thank you, dude. Like, you know, just not just for me, but I'm sure probably for you, too. The understanding that knowing that once again, conspiracy theories batting that almost quote unquote conspiracy theorist batting almost fucking 1000 dog. We very rarely miss. So, yeah, dog, this is all coming again on the news of the fucking Epstein clientele is being uh, released. And there's a lot of controversy. Of course, there was expected to be. 
But I did want to just clarify some shit for, you know, just in case you weren't aware of how the list works. And it's uh, the reason why there's a lot of controversy is, for instance, let's take that fuckhead Jimmy Kimmel, who is, uh, you know, on the news right now currently because of uh, Aaron Rodgers, who uh, accused him of being in the fucking uh, uh, on the flight logs. Right. And uh, he shot back this Jimmy Kimmel, uh, the Jimmy Kimmel character stating that it was, you know, not true. And, you know, whatever, whatever the fuck he said, I don't care, right? The point is that he was very upset about it. And uh, a lot of people are taking Jimmy Kimmel's side because they're saying, well, yeah, look, his name isn't on here. And because his name isn't on here, that proves that people like Aaron Rodgers and those who believe like him are wrong. When it's like, nah, dog, that's not what the fuck is up. What is up is that the names that were released are just the names of one person, their lawsuit. They put a lawsuit against Jeffrey Epstein. One of the fucking 26 people who put a lawsuit against Jeffrey Epstein, those are the names of the people that were there during a spe- very specific time frame that she is accusing them of, right? So it's like, <laughs> this list that just got released, it's not even the whole complete list, bro. It's but a small subset of the names that are on that list. So your favorite Hollywood celebrity, your favorite politician, they're not out of the woods yet, dog. This is just one, one of the fucking, one, one small list from one lawsuit from one of the people who, uh, you know, are accusing Jeffrey Epstein of human trafficking, dog, right? So I just wanted to state that really quickly before I get on to the point. And the point is that I, 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 I don't know, man. I still maintain a little bit of faith about this, okay? And the faith is that this is going to be like, I'm just waiting, dog. I'm waiting. I'm just waiting for the collective consciousness to kick in, bro for the working class to unify under a common fucking umbrella and recognize what the fuck is really up. You know what I mean? And by the way, I hate using this language for reasons that I'll articulate here in a little bit. But for now, I'm just, you know, I, my fingers are crossed. Every single day I wake up, like, please let this be the day that the working class comes together to realize that it's not a matter of ethnicity. It's not a matter of gender, sexual orientation. It's not a matter of religious preference. It's a matter of the haves versus the have nots. It's a matter of the fucking quote unquote good versus the quote unquote evil, dog. It's a matter of the proletariat versus the bourgeoisie, right? And impetuses like this with, you know, the Epstein case, it gives me hope because it makes me hopeful that people are going to come together and realize, like, all this divide and conquer shit is just distraction to keep us from focusing on the real issue. And that is that there are, again, a small group of elites who perceive themselves to be above the law and act as such, that they see the rest of us as nothing more than fucking cattle that they can abuse and use to their fucking own benefit. And it's like, nah, dog. The lives of the proletariat matter more, in my opinion, than the lives of the bourgeoisie. You know what I mean? Like, we, our lives do matter, dog. Just because we don't have fucking billions of dollars doesn't mean that we're, that we're just non-entities that could be discarded away, that can be experimented on, that could be forced to starve, that could be, you know forced to live on the streets that could be forced to fucking work shit jobs just to fucking make ends meet you know what i mean like no dude there's more to life to it there's more to life than that okay and um when the whole when 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 monumental events like this happens where it's proven beyond a shadow of a doubt because even the fucking normie npc news is telling you it gives me hope dog it gives me hope you know and also a little bit of indication, like I talked about, like, yeah, dog, let's see you fucking spin it and elaborate your, you know, do your little elaborate mental gymnastics now that your news sources are telling you, yes, dude, there were fucking people who were allegedly elected politicians who were going to a fucking, not, you know, to an island and they were engaging in the abuse of children, the ritualistic abuse of children, all of which, by the way, was funded by a foreign government. And that foreign government employed its secret service in the form of Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell to, you know, gather the information and gather evidence of this abuse so that they can in turn use that evidence to abuse or rather to blackmail politicians to ensure that they get uh, all the, 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 the Israeli government rather gets all the support that it ever needs to do what it is that it wants to do. What does it wants to do? Dog, fuck, man, I don't know, but I do know one thing. They're taking a lot of money that should be spent here in the United States where people are going hungry on a daily basis, where there's fucking homeless people that are living out on the streets, where there's people who are dying from simple health care conditions because they don't have access to fucking medical care, where there's people who are going incredibly into debt just to pay student loans or rather take on student loans just to get an education to try to get attain some sort of upward mobility. 
motherfuckers in Israel and Ukraine ain't worried about that dog because we're sending them our money, our money, so that they can have that shit. They have the universal health care. They have the public. They have the, you know, the, 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 the schooling. And they have, you know, housing. They're fucking building houses. They're destroying Palestinian homes and building more houses. Like, dog, this, you know, why are we the ones being made here to suffer at the expense of these motherfuckers? Why are we, uh, you know, supporting these fucking wars of aggression in the Middle East? Why are we giving them our unyielding, you know, uh, allegiance as a country, the United States? And it's not because of this fucking religious bullshit. Like, ooh, we got to protect God's kingdom. Fuck out of here with your religious folklore, bro. Like, that's nonsense. We're doing it mostly, mostly because our politicians that are allegedly elected under our free fucking sovereign authority have been blackmailed by that government and they're under threat of having that information exposed to the world are giving them the undying support that they, it is that they want in terms of financial security, right? Like, it's fucked up, dog. It's, it's just a whole crazy situation. And that's why, to me personally, it's so something that always needed to be focused upon, despite all the potential criticisms that come from doing so. So, yeah, that's that's the hope that I have, dog. And I'm not going to front, though. That, there is like a little bit small lingering feeling of dread. And that is that, of course, it's just going to be something that people just... Phew, there's so much information right now, dog. There's so much going on. And I, it's it's not by accident. It's it's entirely by design. Um, you know, I had posted on the gram recently about how there's no way that this is going to be released. These names are going to be released without incident. And sure enough, like clockwork, the fucking day of, the day before, the day after, whenever it happened, the quote-unquote ISIS... Right. Made its triumphant return to, you know, commit a terrorist act in the Middle East, in Iran specifically, that has now garnered the majority of fucking attention, which uh, rightfully so. Right. But um, I mean, that's how this critical theory shit works, dog. They we're not the only ones that study it. They know it, too. And they employ it against us the same way that we do against them. Right. So it was just it was, just, it was so obvious. Like, this is what's going to happen. Like, don't lose sight of the fucking don't lose sight of the ball. You know what I mean? It's just something that I feel can't be ignored, dog, because, bro, a president of the United States, two of them, bro, they're accused of being there. And, you know, it just opens up this whole can of worms that are very, very uncomfortable to deal with, bro. I'm talking about like the Clintons, for instance, just, you know, there's a whole ass rabbit hole that merits its own attention involved with the Clintons and their connections to shit like the Amber Alert system, the Red Cross, the missing children in Haiti. There's a whole rabbit hole, bro. But in terms of this particular point, I'm, I'm trying to just emphasize, think about just how much death and destruction has been caused due to this unyielding support of Israel by the United States. Now, don't get me twisted. This isn't by any stretch of the imagination an attempt to dismiss the suffering of, you know, the, the Palestinian struggle, for instance, by saying, or rather, um, it's not, by talking about that, it's not to dismiss the, the, the harm and suffering that the children have endured at the uh, abuse of the, you know, human trafficking. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to dismiss that element of it. But what I'm trying to state is that on top of that, on top of the, you know, the trauma endured by these countless children in forms of the human trafficking and their ritual abuse by the elite, think about how much fucking political drama and, un, you know, destruction has been caused because of it as well. Look at what's happening in Palestine, for instance. How much money the United States, you know, spends on Israel and, you know, builds their military up so that they can go and do this, you know, to the, the, the people in Palestine. OK, think about, again, the people in the United States who are dying because they don't have access to medical care. They can't afford the, you know, the insulin, for instance. And because of that, they're going to die because the country that we live in, the United States, has decided it's more important to send money to fund a fucking country that is killing people all around the world than it is to fund the actual citizens of this country and provide them with the health care necessary to be able to ensure that they could provide something like as simple as insulin to ensure that that person could keep on living. You know what I mean? That's suffering, dog. Think about homelessness, the plight of people being homeless. Thankfully, I've never been homeless, dog, but we see the homeless struggle and how much pain that must cause on families. You know what I mean? Think about it in terms of the money on a daily basis that you use as being weakened. And how little, it, how far it used to go compared to how little, you know, that same money this uh, will get you just this year alone, let alone who knows in two years if they keep printing more. This is usually the part, by the way, where motherfuckers will accuse me of being a quote unquote bleeding heart liberal. But it's like, bitch, fuck 
you, dog. This has nothing to do with the American political spectrum. This has nothing to do with American or Western European philosophy. This is some fucking... This, this is deep ancestral knowledge, bro. This is the understanding that as a Nawa, bro, your head hurts me. Because, again, we are related. Everything is everything, dog. And not in some hipster New Age or German idealist bullshit type of way. But in an ancestral understanding that we are all comprised of the sacred essence that animates and vivifies every facet of the cosmos, bro. So when a Palestinian is suffering, you are suffering, dog. It doesn't matter. When an Israeli who's been attacked by Hamas is suffering, you are suffering. We are all suffering from it. And the idea that we can't change this because of our political structure is fucking absurd. Especially knowing that the only reason, one of the only reasons that it's happening is because the people that actually are in the positions to make the change are degenerate fuckheads who abuse children. And rather than have to deal with the fucking shame of that evidence being proven correct, they fucking adhere to the blackmail from Israel and give them the, all the money that they need that's able to enable them to continue fucking causing this mass death and destruction. Anyways, I did make a point, dog, and emphasizing, and, you know, I, I talked about it briefly in the beginning and I'll, how I circle back. This is the circling back to a part. Um, and I did just mention right now a point in emphasizing how this isn't the only reason why, you know, Israel is attacking Palestine. I don't think so. I think there's a multitude of reasons, dog. One reason, of course, is because, yeah, the fucking the political class has been compromised, basically. Right. But another reason, dog, is because that very political class here in Israel, in the United Kingdom, they're fucking trying to exploit the land, dog. And that's another trip that I've been on heavy, heavy on the ground recently. And it's the land, dog. Right. And uh, this is actually, by the way, part of the reason why if you ever like follow, if you ever see my post on the gram, OG underscore ice nice 13, if you haven't. Right. Um, you'll know that when I talk about this, I always scare quote calming, dog. And I guess before I explain to you the importance of the land, let me explain to you why I hate this term. And the reason is because it's a very loaded term, dog, both in terms of history and, the, you know, uh, the history of communism in the world, but also because it's associated to European thinkers, dog. And they, again, it's just like Marx, Marx can fucking eat a fat one, dog. You know what I mean? He did. It wasn't I guess he was a prolific writer, but none of what he came up with was unique and had never been understood in the world until Marx came along and told us like, hey, maybe we should collectively come together. You know what I mean? No, dude, it can, again. This it, All that does is give him Mark credit. All that does is continue this false narrative that indigenous motherfuckers that we needed Europeans to tell us that land should be collectively owned for the betterment of all. <laughs> this is this is ridiculous. OK, we've known that the land is sacred and important long before Germany was even an actual nation. Dog. Germany is not that old. OK, and uh, the point being is that Marx ain't teaching us nothing new. Right. And uh, there's mad ways that this can be applied in Nahuatl thought. But again, this ain't the podcast for that dog. This I'm gonna get to. I'm gonna get to belly eventually. But <laughs> like I said, I just wanted to start first by you know running back some of the ideas that I've had. Um, so yeah, not the podcast for that. So I'll just leave it simply with the insight that you know, beyond understanding and acknowledging the importance of the land, we deeply, deeply valued community. Our ancestral Nawa folks, dog, they deeply valued community, and by proxy, the individuals that make up said community. This is why I tell you that. Like, the proletariat, we're just as important as the bourgeoisie, if not more important, okay? Why? Because that's our community, dog. You know, in this ever-increasing, globalized, digitized world, the whole world is our community, bro. It's not just their neighbors anymore. It's the whole fucking world. And it shouldn't be a shocking revelation because they're humans just like us, dog. And again, your head hurts me. When you are in pain, I am in pain too, all right? This is a deeply ancestral insight that comes from the understanding the community and the land is sacred and that community should be made to work towards a common goal that every of the member of the community should join in on, right? So when I use the term Nawa, or rather Kami, okay, it doesn't come from this European understanding, dog. For one, because I don't want it to be associated with what it is that European communists have done because what I'm trying to do, what we're trying to do is completely different, realistically. But at the same time, I know that that's the only way to try to convey for most people the idea that it is that I'm trying to advance communism, essentially, right? Which is why I always scare quoted by saying I'm on my pinko commie era. You know what I mean? Which I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. I'm on my ancestral shit, dog. Because there's very important 
very important differences between communism, quote unquote, and Marxism, you know, by proxy, and the difference between that and our ancestral ways, dog, and, you know, ancestral collectivism. It's huge differences that can't be overlooked. And again, not the podcast for that. This is simply, you know, just introducing it. But the real part that is the main difference is the land, circling back to where it is that we fucking started from, right? It's the land, dog. And the biggest difference is that, you know, between ancestral collectivism and European Marxism is that, dog, we want the land back, okay? And they commies, they want to steal it from themselves. <laughs> Basically, they want, it, they want it for themselves, right? And the idea is that, bro, the land is not for Europeans to divide, homie. It's indigenous land, and it's only for indigenous peoples, the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island to determine what comes of it, right? And usually when I, you know, at least when I'm in my class talking about, you know, Marxism and the importance of land, I get students that ask, well, what the, what's so important about land, dog? And the answer is, bro, literally everything, everything, okay? Put aside for a second that land is literally needed for human survival in terms of food, water, shelter, and safety, okay? And But consider instead how the land literally provides everything, dog, that workers produce, right? In the name of capitalism, all of it is provided to us by the land. The internet that you're using to tune into this podcast, provided by the land, by way of the technological devices that were assembled from the minerals and materials that were extracted from the guts of Tlaltic Pak. The house that you live in, the streets that you drive on, bro, the fucking car you're driving, right? The clothes on our very backs at this moment, all of it comes from the land, right? The land is sacred, dog. Think about the obscene amounts of wealth in a capitalist sense that the land produces. Texas alone, right? It has some of the largest natural gas and oil resources on the planet, dog, which are, of course, produced by the land and fucking sold to the rest of us by the Europeans who stole it not too long ago, right? They're the ones getting fabulously wealthy off what the land provides. Why? What makes them special? Nothing, dog. They're humans just like you and I right? And, you know, maybe it wouldn't even be so bad if they actually did something with the land. That's one of the fucking bullshit critiques that people usually give is, oh, well, at least they're doing something with it. What? What what, what has come from it, dog? Look at the world that we're living in. There is nothing of this fucking world that should be, that people should look at and be like, wow, this is an amazing thing that has been done. When people are fucking living on the streets homeless, when people are going to sleep hungry, when people are dying because they can't afford their diabetes medicine, right? There's this this land, or rather the 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 country, the society that's been you know shaped and on, on the land that's been built on the land that's been stolen. They have nothing to show for it, dog. And it's just I don't know. I get passionate about this, bro, because it just really bothers me. I'm just going to be honest with it, dog. It was just weak, bitch-ass men. Myself included, if I'm being completely honest, right? And I'll I'll talk about it here more in detail in a little bit, but you listen to motherfuckers like J- Joe Rogan, dog, who talk, who talk shit like uh, weak men create hard times. And it's just this bullshit right-wing rhetoric that gives them, people like Joe Rogan and his listeners, the idea that somehow they're the opposite of the weak men, that they are the strong men who are going to bring about the good times. And it's like, nah, dog. You all motherfuckers are the weak bitch ass men too. Just like these little progressive blue haired liberal pipsqueaks that you're always fucking making fun of. You are part of them. I'm part of them too. And the reason why, and this is the ancestral part, is because we have failed in our masculine responsibility essentially to build a better community. All people into account, dog. Not just the ones that can afford it financially. That takes all people into account, dog, not just the ones that we determine are worth value because of the color of their skin or sexual orientation or religious preference. All people, dog, because all people are sacred. Everything is sacred because everything is comprised of the sacred. That's the ancestral shit that I'm talking about. But of course, as soon as I start saying this, most Americans, because of the fucking public brainwashing that we went through in their in their schools, right, they automatically associate with this, this with communism. And they've all been skull fucked to think that communism is a bad thing, right? So we know that's why hucksters like Jordan Peterson can come along and fucking appeal to these fears, these red fears, right? With shit like famines and the gulag arch- archipelago. And people will be like, oh, no, we have to avoid collectivism by any means necessary, right? And it's like, bro, look around. Look around. Where you're getting it wrong is thinking that somehow we're not currently living through similar shit that the 
Russian famine motherfuckers were living through, you know, just less than 100 years ago. All right, man, my bad. I got a little bit sidetracked there. And I'm actually going to leave a little bit of that conversation in because it it informs this whole fucking podcast. I'm not just pulling this shit out of my ass, dog. This is, you know, I live in this world with all, you, with, with all you motherfuckers. You live in this world with me, too. You know what I mean? We have life that happens. And it's just, it's frustrating to think that motherfuckers have to basically pay a subscription to keep living because of the pills that they, you know, should... Just be given, dog. Just what the fuck? Why is there a medical industry that profits off people being sick? You know what I mean? Why do I got to pay a monthly subscription now just to be able to fucking keep living, essentially? You know what I mean? What's the monthly subscription? However much it costs to fucking pay for your medicines that you need to keep you alive. It's ridiculous, dog. Right? And um, what's even more ridiculous is that we live in a world where people can, you know, they will agree with that to every fucking extent until you tell them the solution. And they're like... Fuck out of here with that pinko call me bullshit. And it's just like, bro, do you not realize that you are not living in a capitalist system? Maybe one time it was this country, but not anymore, dog. This is, our, we're already living in a fucking communist hellhole, okay? We have the exact same shit as everything that it is that we're fucking told we should be afraid about on the government takeover, okay? Think about it, dog. The government may not own the land de facto, but all the billionaires that control the government through fucking super PACs, they do, okay? And they utilize the government to, dust, to, to justify this shit, right? Like the centralized land ownership under the guise of quote-unquote capitalism. They use it to justify, you know, the medical industrial complex. It's, it's communism in all but name, homie, right? Just, just peep the wealth ownership, peep the prison population, peep the hunger rate. People always talk about the famine. Like, bro, there's people starving right now. What the fuck are you talking about? Famine about the 1930s Russia. Is it as severe? Like, people are dying in mass? No, but motherfuckers are dying of starvation. You can tell me otherwise? Get it out of here, bro. Right? And that's where it's like, this hustle is so deep that it's legit got motherfuckers thinking that what we're living in is capitalism. It's capitalism in name only, homie. Right? That's why whenever the fucking bankers lose trillions of dollars, we bail them out, right? It, the, the wealth is collectivized and privatized to the corporate class. And, you know, the, the, the ruling class and the rest of us are fucking just made to, to, to suffer because of it. You know what I'm saying? And then they'll say shit like, you can't let the government own all the land because if the government owns all the land, they can control, you know, the food supply. And it's like, okay, yeah, I agree with that. But why are we letting then fucking Bill Gates control all the land? Why are we allowing Bill Gates to buy all the land? How is that any fucking different? Bill Gates, supposedly, right? The government using Bill Gates as a little fucking puppet with their finger up his ass, right? And telling him, you better stay in line or we're going to release these pictures of you with Jeffrey Epstein, right? <laughs> it's the same thing, dog. And yet all these so-called woke motherfuckers will look at it and be like, no, Bill Gates is a private entity. We have to fucking defend him because he's a capitalist and he pulled himself up by his bootstraps and, you know, amassed all that wealth that enabled him to buy all our farmland. So if I have to starve because he says so and if I had to eat the bugs because he said so, then we'll just, well, that's what we'll have to do because it's preferable to living under a communist hellhole. And it's like, you weak, pathetic fucking excuse for a man, dog. You are literally exactly what it is that I'm talking about when I say the definition of a weak, bitch-ass man. I don't care how strong you are. I don't care how fucking full your beard is. I don't care how many Joe Rogan quotes you mindlessly repeat. You are a weak, pussified fucking man if you think Bill Gates and his cronies should be allowed to own all the land, to own all the resources, to fucking determine our fate just because of the name of capitalism. And that's why I'm just like, bro, when I tell you this is not commie shit, this is ancestral shit, dog. We have a responsibility to our community and we are not living up to it. And be, un, it's, it's, it's a tremendous responsibility, dog. It, you know, and it's one thing that our ancestors focus very heavily on creating fucking men in general, but people as a whole who were capable of upholding these responsibilities that it took to fucking maintain a society. You know what I mean? And we are not living up to those standards, dog. Again, me personally, I don't give a fuck how much you can deadlift. I don't care about how many bitches or nice cars you got, dog. I don't care. None of that makes me a, makes you rather a top G in my book, homie. Fuck Andrew Tate. What I care about is what are you doing to uplift your community, homie? What are the flowers that you're going to leave behind from which those that come after us can continue to nourish themselves and flourish after us, right? 
this is what our ancestral ways, this is what our ancestral ways teach us, homie, of the responsibilities that we have. They teach us the discipline necessary to achieve them and the reasons why. And all this has been lost, dog, because of A, colonization, but B, more importantly, how drug-like and euphoric this diseased Western culture is. And it don't matter if you're on the left or the right, dog, both fucking sides of the political spectrum, both sides of the society in this Western degenerate fucking world are, they produce nothing but weak bitch ass men, dog, that, you know, allow shit like this to occur. And that's why I guess ultimately, I don't guess, I know, I wanted to start first before, I'm about, I'm about to get into the belly shit now. So for those of you who tuned in, you know, for the belly shit, here we go, right? The psychology of belly. But, um, that's why I started with the Huitzilopochtli dog, the story, the ancestral story of the Huitzilopochtli. This is very, um, it's very upsetting to me personally, probably to you too, right? But, um, and sometimes I feel as though it's very easy to lose hope because of how monumental the obstacle is. The fucking bourgeoisie got this shit running like a machine, dog. But they'll never be able to capture entirely the, the dynamic spirit of humanity. You know what I mean? There's always hope for resistance, no matter how small that hope might be. The fucking smallest hummingbird can drive away the darkest night, dog, right? And um, yeah, it's not even at this point that I want to, I mean, before I get into the belly shit, I'm going to still do it, dog, but there's still more of this not wash shit that I want to talk about, homie. And uh, it just, you know, for, I, this isn't the podcast to be discussing explicitly the not wash philosophy, so I'm not going to delve too deeply into it. But I'm not at the same at the same time. I'm not gonna just be talking shit and then leave you with nothing to replace it with. You know what I mean? That's not my stilo either. And um, so I guess before I move on to the belly shit, I did want to circle back a little bit to where I talked about how it was the quote unquote New Year, and uh, we don't, you know, in the Nahua culture, they don't necessarily celebrate New Year's, right? Um, because <laughs> this just it's not we we don't follow the Gregorian calendar, okay? But that's not to that's not to state that we don't celebrate new beginnings. And it does just so happen to be that a few uh, a few days ago, we did just mark one such instance of a new beginning, right? And it wasn't necessarily, it didn't coincide with the, the rise of the Huitzilipochtli, okay? But uh, it was a few days after that. Where, because, and again, I've mentioned it before, but it bears repeating for this particular part. You know, the Nawa, we count the days in accordance to, well, the days and the nights, right? The, the days are counted in what's known as a tonal powali. And the nights, uh, right? And uh, it just so happened that the Tonal Powali actually reached its 13th and final flower, the Matlakye Shochit, okay, a few days ago. And because of that, it actually started a whole new cycle, a whole new 260 day count. Now, there's so much more science to it than the little bit that I'm, you know, injustice that I'm doing it. But what particularly makes this new uh, beginning so particularly special is that it's marked by the Huitzilin, okay, which is the turquoise hummingbird. And more specifically, it's more more directly, it's it, it's driven by the Shui Tekutli, okay? Shui Tekut, Shui Tekutli. Eh, sorry. At this point in the podcast, my words, you know, they stopped, they stopped working. My brain just stops working. <laughs> Gotta fight through it. Anyway, so yeah, the Shui Tekutli, right? And uh, Shui Tekutli is just a combination of two words, the first one being Shui and the second one being Tekutli. Now, uh, both of them, they have a few different meanings, right? Shui, for instance, has three different meanings. Tekutli also has like three different meanings. But in this particular sense, when you put them together and you're using them in this particular instance, basically what it means is turquoise ruler, right? And um, there's mad philosophy inherent with that in and of itself, dog. There's, there's so much philosophy inherent with it. Okay, Shui Tekutli, if you were to look it up on Wikipedia, it would tell you it's like the the now the quote unquote Aztec god of like rain and water and fire or something like that, but that's not true. That's not what it is, right? That's European people trying to make sense of it. It's not what it is, right? But I guess in a sense it is kind of like the rainfall because what it really is is you could uh, it's it's more akin to a gravitational force, gravity. You know what I mean? Shuitekutli is made up of two particular pieces. It's it's made up this butterfly. I don't have the piece on me right now, but you could see it like it's a butterfly. If you were to look at the Shuitekutli. It's got, a, it's got a butterfly right here, right? And more specifically, what it is, is like two arrows. One is pointing up and one is pointing down. The arrow that's pointing up is the, the force that's coming from the earth, the emanating from the earth. And the force that's coming down is that which pushes things down or, you know, and both of those come together to make essentially what is time, right? And um, so when you say the rainfall, that's, that's more akin to what they mean. It's not the actual droplets of rain. 
so much as it is the force. The Shri Tekutli is the force that, you know, brings the rainfall down. But it's not just rainfall, it's everything. Shri Tekutli grounds, quite literally, everything, okay? And uh, it's it's a downward pressure. And more, more specifically, the effect that this downward pressure has on us. It's a grounding effect that it has on us specifically, okay? Now again, this isn't the episode to tell to delve rather too deeply into it because, you know, <laughs> for one, I'm not qualified to talk about it. I'm giving you like my own translation of what it is that I was taught, right? And more importantly, because it's important to give our teachers uh, their, their due proper, right? But uh, I will just state it simply is that the reason why I'm introducing it is because, you know, it represents the responsibility that we personally and by extension, the people who fancy themselves the rulers of us, you know, have towards not only ourselves, but to those that we seek to lead as well. It's one of the biggest differences between Western society in general and, and you know, this indigenous Nahua philosophy for sure, culture, and that is that rulers have the understanding that they're not there for their own particular benefit. They can be, they can potentially be there for their own benefit. And uh, that's why they have these very elaborate rituals whenever somebody was taking, you know, a leadership position to try to get them to understand the role that it, to, to, first of all, to prepare them for that role, because no one's born by accident. Everyone is born for a purpose, right? Uh, but more importantly, to, you know, once they're ready to, uh, you know, ascend to that position to actually be prepared for what that role ent- entails, right? And a lot of it was like chance to make sure that this person, they were speaking to their Tezcatlipoca, basically, right? And stating like, you're going to be given an immense amount of responsibility and it's your responsibility to use this uh, this power that you're going to be given, you know, in a way that is respectful of your community, essentially. You have to take into account the people you're going to be leading because they are not just subjects to you. You are like a father to them and you must treat them as you would your own family, Right. And this is something that is obviously lost in this sick, diseased Western society, homie, right? So um, that's kind of the reason why I wanted to introduce it, because it it, it ties together the whole idea of what it is that I'm talking about, of how we personally, as we Western men, are weak. And not just because, you know, for a variety of the reasons that I've already discussed, but more importantly, because we do not have this sort of education that speaks to the power and importance of our heart. We don't have the shwit tekutli, essentially, okay, to remind us of the importance of polishing ourselves, okay, to make sure that we are worthy and capable of leading and, you know, shining the light that needs to be led forward for our community, right? So when it speaks of this grounding pressure, the shwit tekutli, you know, it could be seen in two ways. And one way is that, you know, pressure, it's a lot of, it's a lot of pressure, it's a lot of responsibility. And uh, that pressure and responsibility, it it has two functions. The first function is that it breaks, it breaks people. It's too much pressure. It's too much responsibility. And because of it, they crack and they break underneath that pressure. The second way to respond to it, of course, is that pressure makes gems. Gems are made from pressure and gems shine. They shine, they light and they lead the way. So the same pressure of the Shri Tekutli, the downward gravitational force upon us all, right, can be utilized and harnessed to make us more polished gems, again, that are capable of leading our society. And, you know, (laughs) essentially just a better world, homie. That's why, you know, I talk about this shit all the time, but I I sincerely do mean it, man. A better world is possible, and it does start with the indigenization of the philosophy. You start with the philosophy, dog. You teach the alternative, and you let it be known, like, there is an alternative to this sick, diseased Western world. It doesn't have to be this way, right? And, um, of all reasons, that's how I personally feel that we get back into actually the belly situation. And the reason being, of course, is because the only reason I introduced belly in the previous episode was in response to the podcast that I had with Allah when we were talking about the Jesus and Abrahamic religions and all that. You know what I mean? And it's just like, for me personally, again, I don't see any benefit of those religions at all whatsoever. I, Christianity is not going to save us, Doug. Judaism is not going to save us. Islam is not going to save us. Those three Abrahamic religions, they got us into this mess in the first place. They thrive off this disaster that we're currently living through. They are the result or they are the the the, the impetus behind this current world that we're living in. They're not they're not going to save us, okay? Uh, the indigenizing might. Okay, I'm not saying nothing's for sure, but I'm saying it is an alternative and an alternative is preferable at this point to what it is that we've been doing uh that's gotten us to this position, right? And um Again, if you recall that particular episode, or perhaps if you didn't listen to that episode, I'll just fill you in really quickly. And the idea is just of how many 
just how many different ways there are to interpret reality and how, you know, just simply relying on the religious explanation is, in my particular opinion, it's intellectually lazy because it's so easy to just say it's because of religion and then just, you know, close your mind off to any other potential answer, right? You filter everything through the lens of religion. To me, that's intellectually lazy, which, by the way, going back to the Shwita Kutli, is perfectly in line with what it is that they're teaching us because they are going to tell us through the Shwita Kutli, one of the responsibilities is the responsibility of, you know, intellectual, you know, sharpness, okay? And part of that comes into, you know, tension when we realize that a lot of the personal beliefs that we have may also be wrong. So we have to be willing to discuss, you have to be willing to defend your ideas, but you have to also be willing to, you know, understand when the ideas that you have are wrong. So, you know, the only way to do so is to properly articulate them and discuss them with other people who have different ideas. Is the is this the only truth there is on earth? That's the process of doing that, right? And then try to sharpen and polish rather more specifically, sharpen your tech pot for sure, but polish your gem of understanding to ensure that what it is that you believe to be true is the best version of truthness that you can potentially have at that given moment, right? So uh, this is only possible, of course, is if you take other ideas into account and consideration, which is why, again, I have no problem having, um, you know, Muslim people on and, you know, d- d- uh, talking with them. I have no problem having Christian people on and talking with them, uh, Jewish people on and talking with them about their religious beliefs. Doesn't mean that they're right. Doesn't mean that I'm wrong. It just means that I am able to discuss with them the various different interpretations of reality. Again, and, you know, use those to sharpen my tekpat, the flint blade inside my mind, and to polish my stone to understand greater this truth that it is that potentially exists, right? And to use that truth to help shine the way forward and navigate my way through tla- this slippery earth, tlaltikpak, right? So anyways, all that to say, <laughs> when you know I started talking about the bicameral mind, for instance, initially I was going to do the bicameral mind with belly because realistically, dog, and this is like some film theory geek shit that I'm not going to, there's no point in getting too deeply into it because it's not necessarily the point of this particular episode. But uh, the basic gist is, you know, if you're ever watching something, right, and you're wondering to yourself, like, how do I pick up themes? How do I pick up concepts that, you know, philosophers and the such, you know, that they that they, they narrow in on and say, oh, this is this, this is that, right? Uh, well, there's whole courses about that, just in case you're curious. Find them on YouTube University, Right. Um, but one specific way, and this is why it you know, resonated so deeply with me, with Bali, is that whenever you see people again, to reiterate what I mentioned in the previous episode, um, yeah, all of that to say that is when it comes to like religion and reading the reality and all that kind of shit is like, dog, there is one, you know, it's just but one of many ways to read the whole fucking story. And by reducing it to just one in my particular, you know, way, beyond being intellectually lazy, dog, is actually, it kind of strips a little bit of the the vastness and beauty by proxy of life with it because you know yeah you could read belly through the christian lens and you wouldn't probably even get a movie like belly through the strictly christian lens because it would introduce right from the beginning the super ego character and there'd be no movie um but more importantly you you know it it allows us to be able to read something like belly from so many different ways this is just one of the many different ways in which we can read it and not just belly dog but also as hopefully i've shown by way of my introduction of the nahuatl you know flavor a little bit the various events that are currently unfolding in the world that we're living in dog right which i don't know for me personally is hugely important in fact it's one of the reasons why i tell my students all the time why should we study philosophy to gain practical knowledge of the world that we're living in dog for no other reason than that and um yeah i uh I guess this is about as good a point as any to wrap this bitch up. I hope you all enjoyed it. And if not, I'll try again better for the next one. Until then, I hope you all have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, or whenever it is that you're listening to this bitch. Until then, peace.